Even in its glory years, the NES was a technical underdog, more powerful systems snapping at its heels, but that didn't stop it from being a massive success and the market leader, its jaw seized on the crotch of the gaming public. That metaphor doesn't sound quite as good now I've said it out loud, but anyway, it did really well despite being less powerful than most of its competition, outselling stuff that easily outclassed it. How did it manage that? Well, one thing that played a huge part in the NES's winning run was enhancement chips. Gizmos built into the cartridge that expanded the system's capabilities and helped it keep pace with newer, more advanced machines. And it wasn't just that Nintendo were willing to spend money on this sort of thing, the NES's unusual innards made it very amenable to being expanded in this way. So yes, that's what this video is all about, an enhancement chip exploration, a deep dive into the inner workings of the cartridges that levelled up the NES. So let's start almost at the beginning with Konami's Gradius. Released in Japan in early 1986, this wasn't the first game with some kind of enhancement, but it was amongst the first and is probably the best known and best game from this group of games which all use a cartridge expansion developed by Konami themselves. Dradius, Dradius, however you say it, it's a very fine NES game indeed, a good conversion of the massive arcade original. It looks good, it plays good, you wouldn't find a better shooter you could play at home at this point in time. So how is it enhanced? What magic did Konami bake in? Well, the first thing to note is the amount of data on the cartridge. The original NES games were limited to just 40 kilobytes in size, 32 kilobytes of program ROM and 8 kilobytes of graphics data, which quickly became too restrictive. Nintendo's own solution at the time was the Famicom Disk System, which, well, well, that's another story, but it didn't go quite as planned. It seems to have been Konami, though, that came up with the more pragmatic solution and expanded the capacity of existing cartridges. This may not sound particularly exciting. I mean, this happened with every remotely successful cartridge system, right? They all got bigger games as time went on. And this game here, well, it's 64 kilobytes, a whole 24 more than the standard cartridge. Wow, that's not that much. But this is where things get interesting. There's more going on than just a bit more storage space. Let me try and explain. The NES is a tile-based system. Its graphics are built up of blocks of pixels like these that make up the backgrounds and the sprites. But the NES console itself has just two kilobytes of video RAM built in. This only stores the map data, the layout of the graphics. The tiles themselves, the patterns that make up the graphics, are stored in what's called character ROM directly on the cartridge. The graphics memory for the NES is in fact split up, a bit on the system itself and a whole lot more on the cartridge. It's this split that makes the console so well suited to being enhanced. The graphics memory is exposed to the outside world and it lets you do all kinds of stuff with it. This is not the norm for home consoles. Most didn't do it like this. In fact, this is pretty weird, but the NES's unusual setup opened up a lot of possibilities. Like I said, the original NES cartridges had an 8KB ROM chip for the graphics, enough for 512 unique tiles to build your game out of. Like Star Force here, an earlier shooter, this is all the graphics for the whole game. But it doesn't have to be like this. You don't have to stick with an 8K ROM chip. You can upgrade, and that's what gives Gradius a leg up. That extra 24K is all tile shapes. It has four different 8 kilobyte banks of graphics data to play with, potentially up to 2048 unique tiles. Not only that, but circuitry in the cartridge was designed to flick through these darn near instantly without having to tax system resources much at all. This increases the total amount of tiles available, not just to the whole game, but also the amount you can have on screen at once. That may not sound like that big of a deal, but in pretty much every other game system, this sort of thing was very much fixed, and you couldn't just upgrade it willy-nilly. 
But the NES, with this extra circuitry in the cartridge, can swap the tail memory as the image is being constructed. That's how the status bar in this game is drawn. When it comes to this part of the screen, the game's code sends a signal to the cartridge telling it to switch to another bank of graphics data containing the icons, score numbers and what have you. If we slow the game right down in an emulator and peer into the video memory, we can even see this happen. With extra tiles, the graphics are less constrained. You can have more variety and you can make each level more distinct. Out of the gate, machines like the Sega Master System had an advantage over the NES, its architecture allowing for more complex graphics from the start, but this expansion allowed the NES to claw back some of that to bring it closer to par with its competitors. Tons of games use this technique or some variation of it to expand the palette of tiles available for the whole game and the number on the screen too. But this approach does have some disadvantages though, the big one being that it's not very efficient in ROM space. These are the four 8K banks of graphics that Gradius uses, and you'll notice that some things like the player ship Vic Viper appear in every bank. Obviously you want the player ship to appear in every level, that's why it needs to be there, but it does take up a lot of space. You're wasting a lot of expensive ROM, and even then you're still limited, there are some graphics elements that can't appear together without rearranging everything. That is a problem that could be solved, though not without creating some others too, and that's just what this next game does, with the aid of some extra RAM. Let's take a look at Ghosts and Goblins. From Capcom, released just a few months after Gradius, but with a very different design philosophy on the inside. It was another well done arcade conversion, though absolutely cripplingly hard, yes I did use Game Genie codes to get this footage. It looks pretty good and has a lot of distinct environments and enemies, thanks to this game's massive, for the time, 128KB program ROM chip, and aided greatly by 8KB of graphics RAM. What does the RAM do? Well, instead of storing its graphics data in a fixed ROM file, Ghosts and Goblins substitutes this with a rewritable RAM chip. Graphics data is stored in the very large program ROM file and loaded into the graphics RAM as needed. This is useful because it makes the graphics more flexible. There are some things that you want to be on the screen all the time, like the score, but pretty much everything else constantly changes. By using RAM you can combine any tiles, any graphical elements you like, together on the screen at once. We can actually see the graphics being loaded in by taking a look once again at the video memory. We can see the tile set get updated as it switches from the title screen to the cutscene, and then it all changes again when the first level starts. This happens all the time during the game, we can even see tiles for the main character Sir Arthur being swapped out when he gets hit and proves to the world he thankfully isn't going commando. If you know something about old school games machines, you might well notice that this setup turns the NES into something much more like other consoles of the era. Most of these just had video RAM built into the system by default and didn't expect games to bring their own. But that's the beauty of the NES way of doing things, you can adapt it to what you need. This modular approach allowed the NES to switch things up and borrow some of the competition's advantages when it wanted to. Ghosts and Goblins was the first game to use RAM, but many others followed, often using it in different ways. The legendary Contra used it to save space and make the cartridge ROM smaller and presumably cheaper, compressing graphics data into the program ROM and decompressing it into the RAM as needed. Hatteras, one of the official sequels to Tetris, surprisingly enough. Hatteras, well it had the problem that stacks of different types of hat don't fit neatly into tile based graphics. A problem that was deftly solved by using code that essentially created new tiles as needed, featuring the right combination of hats, putting it directly into the video RAM. 
This gave the system a sort of bitmap display where you can paint arbitrary shapes without having to worry about it fitting into tiles, albeit quite limited. And thus the hat painting problem was knocked off the list of open questions in computer science. But this pseudo bitmap display was something that one game in particular really exploited, the mighty Elite. A truly insane feat of coding that I've spoken about before and will again once I finally understand exactly how it works. I do believe it is the only NES game that features true polygonal 3D and with good reason as this sort of thing doesn't usually work well with tile based graphics. That is unless you're willing to pull off some crazy tricks like Elite does, but even this game is not immune to the big problem that any game using video RAM has, loading speed. Yes, it takes a relatively long time to update graphics stored in this kind of memory, and you can't do it whilst the graphics are being drawn on the screen. And unlike the bank switching method used by Konami for Gradius, you can't really swap out the graphics mid-frame either and increase the total number of tiles you can show that is pretty much off the table. On the American NTSC NES, you could only update around 61 tiles per frame, though the PAL NES managed more because of its lower frame rate, probably the reason why Elite never officially left Europe. Wouldn't it be useful though if you could somehow combine the best of both of these different approaches with the speed of bank switched ROM and some of the selectivity of RAM? Well, you can pretty much do just that. The most widely used solution was developed by Nintendo themselves, this time the mighty MMC3 chip. Yeah, I'm skipping over some stuff here in NES history, but let's go straight for the big guns and take a look at Super Mario Bros. 3. An amazing game, an unassailable classic that made great use of the latest breakthroughs in NES enhancing back then. Its cartridge held 384 kilobytes in total and 128 kilobytes of that was graphics tiles alone. That's 16 8 kilobyte banks of tiles, over 8000 in total, though I don't think the game uses absolutely every bit of space that it could do. The exciting thing is though that unlike Gradius, this game doesn't have to flick through the graphics a full bank at a time. With the MMC3 chip, the graphics can be swapped in and out of the memory very quickly in one or two kilobyte chunks. This means you can easily bring together lots of different graphics on the screen, different enemies, different background elements and different forms for Mario without having to duplicate anything. A lot of the flexibility that RAM gave to Ghosts and Goblins, but with the speed of switching ROM data. Taking a look into the memory, we can see how this is actually used. A lot of the tiles are constantly changing. These are the animated backgrounds. The MMC chip switches through four separate sets of tiles all the time. This going on in the background even if these graphics aren't on the screen. A very neat way of adding animation with very little CPU overhead. We can see the tiles change as Mario jumps in the air, swapping out his tile set for a new one and it changes again when he gets another power up. These changes happen very quickly between frames, allowing very rapid shifts in available graphics, quicker than it could be loaded into RAM. It can also do the same thing as Gradius did and switch the tile set mid-frame, used here once again to draw the status bar. By the time this game saw a wide release, it wasn't just the master system that Nintendo had to worry about, major competition was now coming from 16-bit machines. Although there's a lot about Mario 3 that gives it away as an 8-bit game, when it comes to sheer variety and complexity, it holds its own pretty well against anything Sega or NEC had put out at this point on their next-gen machines. Many games used the MMC3 chip, it ended up being the default standard pretty much in the NES's later years. Possibly the best looking game done with this technology, and maybe just the best looking game on the NES full stop, has to be Kirby's Adventure from 1993. Yes, it's a truly fantastic limit pushing platformer, and the only thing on the NES that can really stand shoulder to shoulder with Mario 3 in the platform genre. The ROM is a massive 768 kilobytes, the largest official Western release, with 256 kilobytes just for graphics, switched in and out in small chunks just like Mario did. 
This is probably the only way you'd be able to have a game with such rapid shape shifting of the main character. Kirby also shares another enhancement feature with Mario that became quite common for NES games in later years, extra work RAM. Yes, another 8 kilobytes of RAM in the cartridge, but this time not devoted to graphics, but to supplement the 2 kilobytes of general purpose system RAM in the console. Yes, 2K might have been enough for 1983, but for bigger, more complex games, this was quite restrictive. Mario uses it to store the game's levels in and keep track of what's happening in them, allowing Mario to explore larger areas. Kirby does something similar, but also adds a battery, allowing the game to be saved. This providing enough juice for the specially designed SRAM chip to preserve data long term. This is one of the few features that other game systems also added to their cartridges, it becoming pretty common, but I'm not sure how often consoles like the Sega Master System used it for things besides saving, as games like Kirby do on the NES. But another feature of the MMC3 chip that really was unique to the NES was a handy extra known as a scanline counter, and although both Kirby's Adventure and Mario 3 make use of this feature, I think another game will show it off a bit better. It's Vice Project Doom. Surprise, a platforming adventure style thing, no short supply of those on the NES, but this is a pretty good one I would say, and it makes excellent use of a cartridge enhancement feature that's got to be pretty obscure to most gamers. What does it do? Well, it counts scan lines. Why is that a thing you would want? Well, let me tell you. The NES's video output is made up out of the aforementioned scan lines, horizontal rows of pixels across the screen that are sent to the TV one by one to build up each frame. It's not all sent at once in these old analogue systems, but line by line. And if you know what line is being drawn at any given moment, if you know when the picture hits a certain point, you can make changes to the image as it's being drawn. You can split it up. Yes, it happens very quickly, fractions of a second, but this makes all sorts of graphical effects much easier. We've already seen this with Gradius switching tile sets when it hits the status bar at the bottom. Gradius was, though, an older NES game and had to make do with the NES's only inbuilt way of determining what was being drawn, what was known as the Sprite Zero hit. Without getting too lost in the detail, this works fine, but you can only use it once per frame. With the scanline counter in the MMC3 chip, you can do it multiple times per frame, meaning multiple splits. You can change tile sets if you want, but you can also make changes to the background scrolling, giving the split screen effect you see on this level. Dropping into super slow-mo once again, we can see all this happening. Those yellow dots represent the scanline counter triggering when it hits a preset point, and the green dots represent changes being made to the background scrolling. By setting the scrolling to different rates, different speeds on separate strips of the screen create the parallax depth effect of this level. Like other enhancement features, lots of games found uses for the scanline counter, and it became a very common feature, not just for Nintendo's MMC3 chip games, but incorporated into other manufacturers' enhancement chip cartridges too. One more thing that helped the Big N keep up with the Joneses product feature-wise, or maybe the Watanabes, or whatever fancy neighbours are called in Japan, this sort of thing being built into other later consoles. As I've said, the MMC3 was very popular, even games that didn't use it directly often used something very similar. That's why so many of those pirate multicarts are based around the MMC3, because so many games are compatible with it, or can be hacked to be so. Enhancement chips are not just a footnote in NES history, they were an absolutely essential part of its success. After around 1986, every new release for the system used them, and whilst it wasn't the first or last console to use this sort of technology, it was unique in just how widespread it was. 
Other systems used bank switching to expand the amount of data the cartridge could store and could use battery backed up RAM for game saving, but none would or could go as far with manipulating video memory as the NES. The only other system I know of that put graphics memory directly on the cartridge was the Neo Geo, and that's another kettle of chips entirely. I should point out that none of the NES enhancement chips were ever anything like as sophisticated as the Super FX chip for the Super NES. There were never any extra CPUs in the carts, nearly everything they did revolved around providing extra space and swapping in and out data or counting scan lines. Nearly everything anyway, some did go a bit further than this, including some Japanese only releases with expanded audio, like Konami's enormous Lagrange Point, which had FM sound synthesis. There are loads of fascinating examples of clever enhancements, which I'm sure I'll get a chance to look into more in future videos. But I think I'm going to leave this here for now, there's more to be said, absolutely, there always is, and I feel like I'm going to do another video on this quite soon, but I think I've covered the big things that NES enhancements did. So I think it's time to ease things to a gentle stop once again. Thank you so much for watching. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. This video, to the relief I'm sure of my regular viewers, has been sponsored by no one at all. Yeah, this one's on me, folks. I'm not going to tell you to download anything, but if you would like to support me on Patreon, that would be fab. So thanks so much to my supporters here, your help is appreciated as always, and I'll say goodbye and I'll see you next time.